Saturday evening, October 20th, 1973. Nixon orders Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire Archibald Cox. Richardson refuses and resigns in protest. William Ruckel's house, the Assistant Attorney General, also refuses and is fired by Nixon. Solicitor General Robert Bork finally does the job. Special Prosecutor Cox is fired. His office is sealed by the FBI. These events are dubbed the Saturday Night Massacre. This is an NBC News special report. Good evening. The country tonight is in the midst of what may be the most serious constitutional crisis in its history. The president has fired the man you just saw, the special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox, and he has sent FBI agents to the office of the special prosecution staff and to the attorney general and the deputy attorney general, and the president has ordered the FBI to seal off those offices. Because of the president's action, the attorney general has resigned. Elliot Richardson, who was appointed attorney general only last May in the midst of the Watergate scandals, has quit, saying he cannot carry out Mr. Nixon's instructions. Richardson's deputy, William Ruckelshaus, has been fired. Ruckelshaus refused in a moment of constitutional drama to obey a presidential order to fire the special Watergate prosecutor. The president has abolished special Watergate prosecutor Cox's office and duties and turned the prosecution of Watergate crimes over to the Justice Department. And the Justice Department is now headed at the President's direction by the Solicitor General Robert H. Bork, who has held his office only since last June. Bork issued a terse statement tonight saying, in explanation of his firing of the special Watergate prosecutor, all I will say is that I carried out the President's directive. The series of events that precipitated this crisis began at 8.15 o'clock Friday night when the president announced that he would not obey a court order to surrender the Watergate tapes. Instead, Mr. Nixon said he would make available a summary of recorded White House conversations which he felt were relevant and which he personally would edit. He would have, the president, say, the president said, he would have the summary authenticated by Senator John Stennis who would be allowed to hear the full tapes. At the same time, the president ordered Special Prosecutor Cox to stop his efforts to acquire those tapes. The president acted less than four hours before he would have been forced to make one of two choices, either to bow to a Circuit Court of Appeals order to surrender the tapes, or to, to, federal, to federal Judge John Sirica, or to appeal that order to the Supreme Court. Mr. Nixon acted after meeting with the Watergate Committee Chairman, Sam Irvin, and the Vice Chairman, Senator Baker. Both went along with the President's proposal. That was an important consideration. There was one other. Had the President defied the Supreme Court outright, he knew he faced a movement toward impeachment by some members of the House of Representatives. So here is where we stand. The President has offered a compromise designed to circumvent a court order which would have required him to tur turn over the secret tapes to a federal judge. He has lost his attorney general in a dramatic resignation. Mr. Nixon then tried to get the deputy attorney general to fire the special Watergate prosecutor, and when the w deputy attorney general wouldn't do it, he was fired. Then Mr. Nixon got the solicitor general to do the job and named him the acting head of the Justice Department. And half an hour after the special Watergate prosecutor had been fired, agents of the FBI, acting at the direction of the White House, sealed off the offices of the special prosecutor, the offices of the Attorney General, and the offices of the Deputy Attorney General. That's a stunning development, and nothing even remotely like it has happened in all of our history. All of this adds up to a totally unprecedented situation, a grave and profound crisis in which the president has set himself against his own attorney general and the Department of Justice. Nothing like this has ever happened before. And what it means is that the worst dreams of everyone who has worried about the president's secret tapes have now become true, become reality. Mr. Nixon has lost Richardson, Ruckel's house, and has fired Cox.
From CBS News in Washington, this is a special report. Here is CBS White House correspondent, Dan Rand. Good evening. In breathtaking succession tonight, the following historic events occurred. The President of the United States demanded that the Attorney General fire Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox, who was supervising the bringing to justice of all persons involved in the Watergate case and related crimes. The Attorney General, Elliot Richardson, refused and resigned. The President then ordered the Assistant Attorney General, the deputy to Elliot Richardson, William Ruckelshaus, to fire the Special Prosecutor. Ruckelshaus refused. The President immediately fired Ruckelshaus. Solicitor General Robert Bork quickly was named Acting Attorney General. Bork was ordered to fire Special Prosecutor Cox. He did. The FBI, acting upon orders from the President, sealed off the Special Prosecutor's office. Congress, of course, is away for the weekend and the momentous events that were announced a little over 24 hours ago and climaxed with the resignation, the one resignation and two firings this evening are having quite an impact on the men of Congress. More about that in when tonight is the climax to a drama that began last night. The president had the White House announce what was called a compromise on the Watergate tapes last evening. The plan, as announced, was to have summaries of some portions of some tapes given to the Watergate Committee and to a federal district court. Under this plan, Mississippi's Senator John Stennis would verify the summaries as accurate. Stennis could listen to certain portions of certain tapes to do this if he thought listening was necessary. Dan Rather, CBS News, Washington. Good night.